guys and welcome to the Leftover Culture Review, the only review show on the internet that is currently like knee deep into trying to do this book report. And it's not like I can't do a book report, it's just that I really, really don't want to. I am surrounded by books right here in the games room that I could pick from. Uh, they're all actually Goosebumps books. But I really only bought these things because the covers are cool. I never actually planned to read them or do a book report on them. So look, I'm in a bit of a pickle, but with you guys showing up, I'm actually starting to get a bit of an idea here, right? What if I could find a Goosebumps book to do a report on that actually had like a TV episode made on it, as well as like a video game? We could look at all this stuff together and actually create a book report without ever having to read the book. I think I've got the perfect one. Attack of the Mutant. So this is a Goosebumps book with like a superhero theme. The back it says talks about like comic book collections, super villains are out to take over the universe. Um, that actually sounds kind of cool for a Goosebumps book. So look, let's get started by checking out the TV episode together. Like this could literally be the best play date that we've ever had. I'm actually super excited. So look, if you guys grab a pen and a paper, take a few like loose notes while we're watching the TV episode together, you know, just format it into a thousand word essay with double spacing as well as the cover page and send it through to bruiser at leftoverculturereview.com. I'd be like totally appreciative and not too much work at all, right? And then we'll play the video game and then yeah, we'll have like a book report without ever having to read the book. <sighs> you know, school has never been prepared enough to handle how clever I really am. So let's do this thing right. Best play date ever. You go grab a pen and paper. I'm going to run the intro. Let's do this thing. As soon as you get back, we're going to be watching the TV episode, Attack of the Mutant. Man, this intro brings back like just so many memories. I hope you grabbed your popcorn because this is going to be, it has to be good, right? It is a Goosebumps TV episode. And right, as soon as like we hit play, we are given these like comic book panels, like bam, so much action right there in the first scene, right? I mean, it's a really cheap way to do an action scene. But if you are craving some more comic book action and this isn't cutting it for you, did you know that there is a Bruiser comic book over on the Leftover Culture Review website? I'm going to leave a link below. Look, comic book action can't last for long <laughs> because we need to be introduced to Skipper, our valiant hero. The, the kid we're going to be following this whole episode around for. I always think it's kind of funny, like, they're really concerned about the father finding out about Skip reading comic books, but this guy, he's like straight out of Revenge of the Nerds. I, I'd probably be a bit scared of him too. He, he doesn't look particularly brutal, but man, that whining would drive you crazy, right? That is not the point. Your obsession with these things, you know, it's unhealthy. You don't pay attention to anything else. He doesn't pay attention to anything else. So as far as special effects go, Watching the mutant pop out of the bed, uh, out of the comic book, sorry, it looks like a bed sheet close up. Watching the mutant pop out of the comic book is about as good as it's gonna get for a really, really long time. So I, I hope you're satisfied. <laughs> I hope that's hooked you in enough to continue watching this episode. So Skip has obviously fallen into like a bad crowd. His best friend Wilson is addicted to rocks and he's getting followed around by this blue guy in a latex suit. Like things are getting pretty weird. And obviously Skipper's mum has lost her license because he has to catch the bus everywhere. I can't even imagine how much that would suck for a kid not having a mum to just like drive you around everywhere you need to be. Uh, public transport, man. Skipper is probably a bit braver than I gave him credit for. And he's also a lot better at talking to the opposite gender. Like I've got to give him some real props here. High school Harry with those stupid little tic-tac-toe check marks all over his temples. And that guy Beanhead, so nauseated. He is mature, level-headed, and really witty. Uh, I really hate being upstaged in my own videos. So 
Um, I, want, I want to insert some fart noises so that Skipper looks like a total idiot. Are all the boys at Franklin like you? Nah, I'm the coolest. <laughs> oh man, I missed my stop. <laughs> So look, at about the seven minute mark, Skipper gets to check out the Secret Mutant's headquarters. It is bright purple, phallic, and really, really tall. Uh, perfect for our like guy dressed in a blue latex suit following around a young boy. It just works so seamlessly into the story here. I think if we should add anything into our book report. It's how many times Skipper goes to the Secret Headquarters, but doesn't go in. He goes home instead. He comes back, he goes home. Comes back, goes back. Skipper is really, really flaky like that. So Skipper tries to go back to the secret headquarters, but it's become invisible, it's disappeared, and people are calling him crazy. But he gets a special edition comic book which shows him how to get to the secret location of the lab. It can't be. It's uh, surrounded in an invisibility curtain because um, I guess the mask mute didn't have the budget for it the first time round, or Goosebumps didn't have the budget to show it so many times. But Skipper does manage to go back to the secret lair for a third time. For, for the hero of our story here, he definitely isn't the brave and adventurous kind. He um, he wants to go in the secret headquarters, but he it, it takes him a while to build up the courage. I don't know if that's to save the budget for the TV in, episode of that really does happen in the Don't book where we, just yeah, just spend a lot of time in, in the parking lot here for the Secret Mutants headquarters. The whole pace of this episode is really slow. I'm actually kind of regretting that we're watching this together. Because I love hanging out with you guys, but I get really impatient, especially when it comes to like Goosebumps TV episodes. I feel like they should be short and sweet. I feel like you're summarizing a whole book into like a half hour TV episode and they took a whole hour to summarize this book and we spend so much time dealing with Skipper's crappy family. Um, really weird bunch of characters. So blending some seamless green screen work, special effects, we get to see the Mask Mutants headquarters. It's bright, it's bold, it's wacky. It just reflects the personal style of the Masked Mutant so well. Uh, the, awesome. the personal style of any supervillain trying to take over the whole universe. Um, yeah, it, it's great. The green screen work is, is spot here? on and the whole place just looks like a massive box of crayons. I feel like I'm standing in a giant box of crayons. So our heroes very promptly make their way down into the basement. Uh, I guess the Masked Mutant's main lobby didn't have a reception desk. They're trying to work out where to go next. They head down into the basement. Essentially, it's like the back lot of the studio where they filmed, I guess. <laughs> Again, budget saving measures, but we get like brick walls and pipes and it really feels like, yeah, just the back lot of the studio. But with a few cool lights, you know, you can make anything look great. Um, did a pretty good job in this room, don't you reckon? And after getting separated from Libby, Skipper keeps exploring. He's he's a bit goofy, but he does find some original artwork there in the Masked Mutant's basement. It's me. Why are there pictures of me? It's me. <laughs> this part always kind of cracks me up because who would jump to that conclusion? Like, um. He's just wearing these really sort of general three layers of clothes. I don't know if that's a Canadian thing. Here in Australia, if you get caught wearing more than two, I think they send you home to get changed again. But um, yeah, he's just kind of like, he looks so plain. Yeah. <laughs> and then right at the end, we get a, I guess our only scare of the episode, where Libby scares like, uh, you know, Skipper with a cardboard cutout. He, he's not particularly brave or valiant. I, I I don't know why he's our hero. I wonder if he's written that way in the book. But look, it's it's a two-parter episode. I guess as far as our book report's concerned, having a whole hour of content to digest and turn into our book report's good, but I really think this should have been like a half-hour episode. I don't think it's exciting enough to, to f carry like a full hour of watching. But at least we're in the superhero headquarters. Right? Well, to kick off part two, I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot here, but
but Skipper goes home again. <laughs> he made it into the headquarters, he went to the utility room, he hung out in the back of a studio for a bit, and, and he goes home. Again, to see more of Skipper's crappy family life. So, again, Skipper gets prompted by a special edition comic book and goes back to the Mask Mutants headquarters. I guess, for the purposes of our book report, again, you can just basically copy and paste the story because it, it's, it happens again and again. It's like repetition, almost. He gets prompted to go to the secret lair, he leaves. He gets prompted to go back, he leaves. He gets prompted to go back. But once Skipper makes it back into the Mask Mutant Supervillain headquarters, he decides to hang around until the end of the episode, which is really good of him. Um, again, look, it's it, it looks like a factory or like an industrial construction site, but he does get to finally meet one of the superheroes from the League of Good Guys. Now, you might be a bit shocked to discover that that's Adam West being the galloping gazelle. His main job really is to fill in the plot from the last 30 minutes um, and to try and get the story moving again. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be like a whole league of good guys. I didn't realize it was just one, um, but there's only one good guy here in, in the TV episode that, that Skipper has to save. And look, his superpowers include a cool blur effect because he can move really fast. He's the galloping gazelle, after all, and uh, fat jokes. <laughs> he really makes Skipper feel guilty about his weight. Like, I've tried to avoid it a little bit because he's he's supposed to be like your typical comic book nerd, which I, I think is already a really negative stereotype. But, um, yeah, I didn't realise the Goosebumps TV show would go there and, yeah, m make fun of the hero, the hero of our episode. That's kind of low. <laughs> and as far as factory sets sort of go, I love how much this one looks like a game show. It's bright, it's colorful, it suits the Mask Mutant. I already made that joke. It's, it's the worst supervillain headquarters I've ever seen and the electricity bills must be like just through the roof because everything's lit up everything's got like this blue red haze to it which um look I'm I'm a big fan of the style of lighting I just don't think I'd want to work in that every day as a supervillain it doesn't feel practical but look the galloping gazelle and skipper are there to stop the masked mutant as far as you know supervillains go there don't seem to be any henchmen in this episode there don't seem to be any other heroes either like this is the masked mutant's operation he's running it all by himself luckily for the masked mutant though his his like superpower is being able to change shape. He's a shape shifter. He transforms from a chair into a man with snake arms. Uh, again, the special effects budget, um, they really made it stretch. So you've got to admire that, right? The Galloping Gazelle launches into his special move, which is spinning around really, really fast. The blur effect, it comes back in full force. But this time, the Galloping Gazelle, he trips and then he decides to leave, telling everyone that he's just gotten too old for it and Skipper has to take over. So, you know, a great superhero plot here for the whole family to enjoy. Um, superheroes get tired and lazy as well. He makes a very, very quick exit and it's up to Skipper to save the day. For a superhero episode, it's actually kind of a disappointment that the adults couldn't even put on a good superhero fight and Skipper basically wins by knowing what the Masked Mutant can and can't turn into. Once Galloping Gazelle leaves, the Masked Mutant continues like just filling in the plot holes and things that the episode didn't cover itself in the last 40 minutes. Um, and tries to very slowly kill Skipper with a massive crane that I'm not exactly sure how he was going to kill Skipper with a crane anyway. <laughs> the more I think about it, the more confused I get. Like, why did the Masked Mutant publish 
his own comic books and send limited edition versions to Skipper so that he could find the super villain headquarters. <sighs> this book report is going to be a major pain in the butt, but I could totally see R.L. Stein using this as like a hook in one of his stories. He's definitely known for having good twists at the end of his book. So, um, look, I, I guess... I guess the only thing I'm really thankful for is that you're putting all the notes together for the book report. You know, thousand thousand words, just casually double spaced cover letter would be great. Email through to me so I could submit it on Monday next week. If you could, please. So following on from the TV episode, I was really keen to check out Attack of the Mutants, the video game. You start out on a bus getting dropped right off at the Masked Mutants headquarters. You just dive straight in. You don't have to go home. You don't have to deal with Skipper's crappy family life. Um, straight into the game, straight into the Masked Mutants hideout. It's not very well hidden. And right out the front, there's like a park bench and a mailbox as well. So already the game is sending a few mixed messages, but you also get introduced to eight different villains and a whole bunch of different superheroes. So it's um it's already throwing a few red flags at my book report. Is there only one bad guy, the masked mutant? Or are we dealing with eight different super villains? It's gonna be me who gets to rub them out. <laughs> Not if I get to them first. Oh, back off, Thorny. Just be glad one of these digits ain't a pair of pruning shears. Enough! I guess the truth lies somewhere in between, but this game, it actually follows this like first person shooter style gameplay, but it really is like a puzzle orientated game. You're looking for items, you're trying to complete the next piece of the puzzle so you can progress further into the Mask Mutants hideout. But there are plenty of sections in the game itself where you do just have to destroy things with your like blaster. You go around the Mask Mutant secret headquarters saving the League of Good Guy heroes who have been trapped. You need to find the right items to defeat the villains and stop the master plan to take over the world. It's up to you to save the day with a comic book in your hand. The key to this whole puzzle is that comic book that you start off with. Oh, it's okay. I'm okay. No big whoop, no major damage. So yeah, the TV show left a lot to be desired. I'm guessing it's a pretty it's a pretty good adaptation of the book, but the video game has just so much more going for it. You get introduced like there's a whole cast of different characters, which already throws a spanner in the works for our book report. I'm not sure if there's supposed to be like one hero and one bad guy, or if there really is like eight different like superheroes and eight different bad guys in the book. Uh, I guess the truth is somewhere in the middle, but the video game doesn't cut any corners when it comes to the story. They introduce everybody. They use live action footage. They use CGI animation. Um, they use cut scenes. There is just so much story in this very simple, in this very straightforward style. So the Mutant Secret Headquarters is a seriously weird, eclectic mix of a stuff. It's been kind of established that both in the TV episode, I'm, I'm guessing in the book as well, it's, it's bright, it's flamboyant, it, it's really over the top as, as far as super secret layers go. But it also acts as like a publishing house for the Masked Mutants comic book. The comic book that he makes and writes about himself, which, which is kind of weird, right? Cruising around these halls, it doesn't take you long to run into your first enemy. And one thing that I really like is even though this game is set up like an FPS game, you really need to find the right item. It, it feels a lot more like puzzle solving. You need to have the right items. You need to find the right items. You need to be in the right locations. You need to explore. And, and because we're spending so much of our time in the super secret headquarters, running around, having having just the time of our lives, I, I guess, uh, you really get to explore just how weird and flamboyant and crazy and wacky this whole super secret lair 
really is. It's bright, it's colourful, <laughs> and it's so, yeah, just cluttered. And there's even like a garden stage and hedges and... <sighs> The more you play, the weirder and weirder the plot is going to get. Like, I didn't think Attack of the Mutants plot, especially the TV episode, was all that, you know, crazy. I, I don't understand why a supervillain has his own comic book publishing, um, you know, service, but uh, the plot itself didn't really leave you scratching your head. But here, it is like this absolute adventure. As you travel around the castle, you discover all these different rooms, all these different supervillains. And the Mask Mutant really put in like a lot of effort putting together his ultimate team of really weird bad guys. And one thing you might have noticed is that this game does a terrible job focusing on Skipper's really crappy family life. There's no mention of his dad, no mention of his mum, there's no lectures from parents. It is just missing all that stuff. It's just gameplay. Man, how weird, weird right? Maybe, maybe that's why this game didn't do so well. Actually, that's one thing that's always surprised me about Attack of the Mute, because I loved Escape from Horrorland. I loved the atmosphere. I loved how they took the material from the book and really tried to expand on it. It was all FMV, but the effects were great. There was different like paths to take. There was so much to explore and so much to discover. It felt like a Goosebumps experience packaged up for CD-ROM. and. That game came out a year before Attack of the Mutants. Attack of the Mutants was also put out by DreamWorks. Attack of the Mutants came out at around the same time that the TV episode came out. Goosebumps was a big deal. Goosebumps was doing really well at the time. It, it petered off really quickly, but Attack of the Mutant should have been great. But um, look, the game is clunky. The game doesn't particularly play very well. I love the fact that there is a puzzle solving element to it. And when the game does try to do some first person stuff, there are a few like action levels where you do get to shoot things. Um, there's a bit of platforming in the ice levels. There's like a swamp where you need to defeat a monster. There are some really cool elements and they did try to do a few different things, but overall the game feels really quirky, really, just weird. <laughs> more checking, more bashing. <laughs> you didn't tell me she got out. What have we got so far on Attack of the Mutants? Well, look, we know there's either one superhero or there's like eight. And then we also know there's either one villain or again, there's like eight or nine. There's a lot of villains in this game. There's a lot of characters for a video game. We know that Skipper's got a pretty crappy family life, but he might not also have a family life at all. We know that the hero is absolutely useless and it's kind of up to you as like some random kid who's walked in off the street to clean up this mess. We also know that the comic books that you receive are the whole key to uh, beating this whole thing. But we also know that the Masked Mutant pushes out and publishes those comic books from his super secret hideout, which also has like a gardening center and portals to different worlds. So, um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling really confident about our book report. If you can just like summarize that for me, put it in a few lines, um, you know, a thousand words or less, cover page, double space, and send it through to bruiser at leftoverculturereview.com. Uh, I think, I think that's a wrap. I don't, I don't really want to cover any more Attack of the Mutant stuff because the more I think about it, the more confusing it all really becomes. None of this is really making much sense to me, but the game itself, um, yeah, it doesn't have any of that charm. It doesn't have any of the atmosphere that the Goosebumps Horrorland games had. It's really missing that for me. I loved Escape from Horrorland as a kid. That was one of my favorite games ever. And it was a Goosebumps game. It actually had so much material from the story, from the TV episodes. It was all sort of included there in this video game, but the game itself really felt like it could stand on its own. You didn't need to know everything about Horrorland. You were just going to the spooky park they mentioned that they've been there before and they've got rides to go on and tickets to win and, and places to explore from the show, from the book. It was an incredible game. It had some really big names in it. It was all done in FMV, but it was like this incredible adventure that let you go through the park, find out different areas, find secret areas and compete for your lives to get out of there again. Attack of the Mutants, I guess it gives you a lot more freedom compared to an FMV game. 
because you get to explore this supervillain headquarters, but it is such a quirky game. None of it feels consistent. None of it really works for me. Attack of the Mutant just, it missed the bar so badly. I love the puzzle solving aspects, but there's no real reason to keep playing this game. There's no charm. There's no real like goosebumps atmosphere unless you really just want to check out those cutscenes. That's what kept me going as a gamer because some of the cutscenes were so janky and just, they, they had to make you laugh. Heads up! What are you doing? Talking about Horrorland, talking about how much of a better game Horrorland is, it's interesting that they actually revisited Horrorland when it came to releasing the next Goosebumps game after Attack of the Mutant in 2008. They released it on PlayStation 2, on the Nintendo Wii, as well as on the DS. I picked the DS version because you actually get to go back to Horrorland and you get to ride on the rides. You're not playing as the characters from the book. It's like an all new, it's like new kids entering Horrorland and you're one of the new kids and you get separated from your sister and you need to like find your sister and just get out of there. There's another girl that you find to help. But plot aside, because the plot's not really that important, it's basically a collection of mini games and you need to finish the rides, earn your tickets, move on to the next area, repeat. It's incredibly frustrating because some of the rides are incredibly difficult, but some of them are fun. It's such a mixed bag of a game, but with the DS at least, you got to use your stylus. There was a few different ways to control the rides that you were on. So I definitely recommend checking out the Horrorland games because they really were the experience that I was after when I booted up a Goosebumps game. I wanted to feel that Goosebumps, that spooky atmosphere, and this game just didn't do it for me. But can I just say that if you are after a real Goosebumps experience, I've been reading the Tales to Give You Goosebumps over on my Leftovers channel. I have been reading these Goosebumps stories and just creating like little mini audiobooks out of them. So definitely go check out some actual original Goosebumps stories over on the Leftovers channel. I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your time with me tonight. The Attack of the Mutants games really left a lot to be desired, but um... I'm glad that I got to waste that time with you and I'm glad you could help me out with my book report as well. Um, thanks. Thanks so much for tuning into the Leftover Culture Review and I can't wait to have you tune back in for some more Leftover Culture. Cheers guys.